Hey guys, welcome to the London Lift podcast. Today we are continuing our movement mastery series and doing a deep dive on the bench press. Yeah, buddy. you've all been waiting for. I think uh, it's a movement that's held a lot of importance in a lot of people's training routines for a long time. And we w want to get down and dirty into the nitty gritty details of how to execute it best for what you want in your training, some common pitfalls, and also our thoughts on whether it's actually a good movement or not in the grander scheme of things. Mm. But before we get into it, uh, we just want us to give you a reminder of our 100th episode is coming up and we are running a competition to celebrate whereby if you share an episode, you enter a raffle to win a huge prize of a muscle imbalance assessment with me, two months of stronger group coaching with Rob and also a 60 minute training review where both of us will have a look at your current programming, training practices, lifestyle, nutrition, anything you want, you can pick our brains for a whole hour on top of the other two parts. So all you need to do to enter is share any episode you'd like on your Instagram story and tag us at lunge.lift. Uh, you can enter once a day, so as many times as you want in the lead up to our 100th episode. And um, you get two entries if you subscribe on YouTube. If you're already a subscriber, please leave a comment and we'll give you your two entries there. And three entries if you leave us a written review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. Is that everything, Rob? Yeah, and also you, yeah. if you're on Spotify or you don't listen to a Spotify, head over to Spotify and just give us a cheeky little five star. Just literally so easy, just tap review and it's done. Oh, it's so easy. I, I reviewed us as five star, of course. So I thought <laughs> it's great. So there we go. Mm. Um, awesome. And as always, a quick thank you to our show sponsors, wit-fitness.com. Use discount code LL15 to get 15% off your purchase. And Hytro, use discount code LL20 to get 20% off your Hytro purchase as well. Mm. So, Ash, let's, uh, let's take this deep dive and move a mastery session of the bench press. And I think it'd be really good to start out where I think a lot of our listeners are within the CrossFit slash functional fitness sphere. And I, I would, I would hazard the guess that a lot of us have come from a bit of a bro, broette style background where we might have done quite a bit of bodybuilding. And then we were just like, do you know what we want? Something more performance focused. We want to start actually forgetting about just the way we look and actually start get moving better and feeling better and then we go to crossfit and it's like oh no bench press oh, no dumbbells and it's like oh okay cool so you do all your big movements and then then actually some dumbbells get involved in like a couple obviously a good few years back now and like, okay now dumbbells are starting to get involved and then oh look they do linda at the games or the regionals oh some bench press okay maybe we should start bench pressing and then you start bench pressing again mm. you're like fuck i've got weak at the bench press so the main reason for that I was trying to bring up that that history of functional fitness and bench press is because it's not really functional in the slightest. Yeah. And I think because of that, people then disregard it. But I'm, what I love is at the moment where the popularization of like functional bodybuilding and stuff like that, the, the world of bench pressing is definitely coming back into the functional fitness space beyond just the fact that it probably doesn't help you clean and jerk or your snatch so what have you found and like over this probably like say what the past five six years where it's kind of been transitioning back to this yeah so i think for me bench press holds a special place in every gym bro's heart yeah. because it's the exercise by which everyone basically measured themselves and uh you know the guy with the biggest bench always got the most praise in yep. the gym and it's just got that role in gym culture. Mm. Uh, and I think, yeah, just echoing what you're saying there about its evolution in the functional fitness space and that people didn't really build it into CrossFit programs and it still doesn't get used very much in most CrossFit programs because like you say, it doesn't have that much carryover to many real life movements or applications mm. there's not very many situations when you're lying on your back and pressing weight away from you and if we think about horizontal pressing in sport think of stuff like handoffs in rugby it's always standing mm. and there's a rotational component it's very rarely a clean bilateral horizontal press uh, lying on your back 
However, because people love the movement, it is starting to make a reappearance and it has featured in some CrossFit competitions. So it's something now that if you're trying to be fully prepared as a CrossFit athlete, you need to have it in your arsenal. And I think people just like it as a movement because it feels good. And that's you also get to enough. lie down to do it, don't you? It's, it's, <laughs> it's a, compared to everything else, you've got to put so much effort into standing position like this. You get to just lie down and press the world away. And what what's funny is I think, I don't know if it's just me seeing it from when I look at CrossFit as doing it, but it's just, it always gets bantered about. It's like, oh yeah, I'm doing the bro day. I'm doing the chest. Pr-. It's like, just just own it. Like you're benching. Yeah. It's great. It's, it's, it's an awesome exercise to do. And I think it's, I think another kind of like, uh, kind of shift in mindset I think needs to happen is, women are starting to appreciate a bit more as well because I, I, a couple of my female clients over the time and even current ones are like, do you know what? I want to start benching. I'm like, mm. great. It's like, you have a chest too. Yes, you also have some other things on top of that chest muscle, but you have a chest. You should be benching. It's, an, it's part of like being covered across the boards. And I, I think one thing I would say, you said this doesn't really have any practical life, but I'm saying, you know, when we think about falling over and getting back up like a burpee, mm-hmm. so it's quite a thing. Yeah. What happens if you fall onto your back and you can't roll over and something's falling on top of you? Like you've got a cupboard <laughs> that's falling on top of you. You need to push that cupboard off of you. Oh, <laughs> exactly, you roll over, right? So, but forgetting about that kind of stuff, uh, I think what would be really good is if we kind of dive into like how we did the other ones where we discussed things like set up, how to maybe do the lift, um, yeah. any tweaks to the lift and maybe some common mistakes. So I think setup is a, obviously, I think a really good place to start. And I think the first thing to address, I guess, is why are you benching? Because exactly. that determines setup. Exactly. I think it's a common theme for a lot of the discussion points we have on the bench press is what's the purpose for having bench press in your program at all? And depending on what you're trying to get out of it will affect a lot of the answers or recommendations we have. So if you are a competitive power lifter compared to a bodybuilder, compared to a crossfitter, there are going to be certain differences in how you approach the bench press and how you look to execute it. And if we start with a setup, one of the common talking points on the bench press is whether you should arch your back or have your back flush to the bench and maybe even have your feet up on the bench to make that easier. And the considerations here are having an arched back, you're going to have, have your arched back brings your chest up. So if you're a competitive power lifter, that has a benefit in that it reduces the range of motion because you have to bring the bar down to touch your chest. If your chest is higher off the bench, then actually you're doing less work because the distance that the bar has to move is smaller. So you can lift more because you're not having to move it as far. Compare that to training for life and trying to train a muscle through a bigger range of motion so you have more movement options that's obviously not what you want because you want the biggest range of motion if you're a bodybuilder as well you're looking to get maximum stimulus through the the muscles that are working so again trying to work them through a fuller range of motion generally has a better hypertrophic response than partials unless you've got your contraindicated against full range yeah and i think the arch back position i think even when people arch their back they still may not be doing it correct either because there's there there is a technique to the arch it's not just bend your back and hope and i think this is where then people then sometimes complain about bad backs when they're benching so then they mm-hmm. have to like oh i need to put my feet up when i bench because it hurts my back it's like no no you just your execution isn't great so it's like we need to then break that down to understand why you're arching and if you do need to arch like you said there now i think just to make it clear with like the execution of the lift with the setup of the arch when it comes to power lifters they have to show control through the full range of motion essentially pause on the chest it could be of a, it's down to the judge's um judge's choice really if he doesn't see control of the bar and he wants you to keep it there then you've got to keep it there and press when he says press with a um, bodybuilder, obviously, as you said there, they're looking for that my muscle connection, trying to take their muscle either through their full range of motion or just make sure they're getting the best contraction from their chest as possible. And with crossfitters, most of the time, it's just get the bar from locked out to chest and back up. There is, I don't care how you do it, you just got to get it from A, B and back to A. So exactly. 
Also the opposite of a bodybuilder in that you're trying to minimize time under tension rather than maximize it. Exactly. And that's where there's a lot of similarities to a power lifters bench because they're obviously trying to move maximum weight. But then it goes to the complete opposite in a way because they're looking for kind of chest sinking and using their chest and a back. to So they want to lose their arch to press out into their arch to actually get the bar moving again. So... It's, this is where I think where there's so many videos and stuff online of like how to bench press. I think what a lot of these things miss is for what intent. Yeah. And that's that's what we really want to get out today. And uh, uh, we, we appreciate a lot of our episodes kind of always goes back to it depends, but we don't want to just always leave it with it depends. We want to give you the, the answers to each scenario. And we think with this, you know, arch back across the board, even for, say, you're trying to get some growth, yes, it will still be quite good because if you're using a bench press to, say, grow, you know, you might be just looking more than for maximum load because if you're a bodybuilder, you probably wouldn't necessarily be using a bench press to grow your chest. You'd be using things like dumbbells and machines. But that's we're obviously mm. going to touch on that a little bit later. But Yeah. yeah. So I think um, one of the other considerations for why you might arch your back if you're not just looking for the heaviest one rep max is for from a safety point of view whenever we're trying to lift weights the amount of stability that we have will dictate how much weights we can use so if your body detects instability it's going to shut down the range of motion and also reduce the amount of power output it gives you so further to just reducing the range of motion in competitive bench press arching your back slightly you can put more weight into your shoulders and it, you actually get a mechanical stabilization effect through the shoulder girdle because you're now pressing your weight into the bench, mm. pinning your shoulders in place as compared to lying flat where there's less pressure holding your shoulders in position. So even if you're not just one rep maxing, you can keep, say you're a bodybuilder, you can keep the focus on the target muscles more easily by reducing the stability requirement from the rest of your body yeah and there are other parts to do with this but i want to kind of touch on those more in execution when it does come to the arch but i think another part is i guess where you grip the bar because mm -hmm. f for me that's this is where when you look in competitive powerlifting, you see obviously people have varying grip grips and like the wider you grab obviously they say that shorter range of motion you're going to be mm -hmm. and it's very individual. Some people are really strong at there. Some people are weak as shit out there. I, when I remember when I went wide with my bench, I was just like, this feels terrible. And I just, I, it was just bad on my wrist. It just, it just wasn't comfortable. And I actually found it a lot more comfortable being closer to like more like a close grip bench and making sure people understand that they aren't say watching. Close grip bench isn't necessarily hands together. That's like super close grip bench. We're talking close grip bench is anything in from your normal bench press position. So where my hands would be, it would normally be at the start of the knurling. Like I would, that's where my first finger would be. And that would mean I'd get a nice, big, tight range of motion. And because I have relatively strong triceps, it's because mm. it's close to a close grip bench, it was a bigger range of motion, but I created so much more stretch that I could push through into that. And I found it quite beneficial for me for a period of time until I actually got a bit stronger. And then I was like, actually, this isn't any good anymore. And I went back to a, a moderate grip. But um, it really does play a huge part. And I think, I guess it does come down to the thing of, are you doing it for bodybuilding? Are you doing it for powerlifting? Are you doing it for weak point training? Are you trying to be better at a certain part of the lift by say like doing close grip to increase your range of motion? Exactly, exactly that. So again, we come back to leverage and the physics of it. Going wider creates a longer lever around the fulcrum which is your shoulder but because you reduce the range of motion you can um, lift more weight in that setup so everyone's going to have a sweet spot depending on their wingspan as to how wide their grip should be for maximum load or for biasing certain muscle groups so like you say there everyone kind of knows close grip bench is better for triceps going a bit wider is going to be a bit more pecky and chesty mm. and depending on the training stimulus you're trying to get, will change your grip width uh, for what's optimal. Mm. So now I think, I guess since we're still talking about the upper body, let's go on to elbow flare because this is something that I know over the years, I've I kind of done a, not a 360, 
but I've understood why I've come back to where I am now. And it was when I first started benching, dumbbell benching, like benching with the elbows flared out, slight bit of internal shoulder rotation, uh, not good. Oh, bench press always gives me shoulder issues. Uh, so I'm going to use more dumbbells to get really stronger dumbbells and then it become hard to get it up. Then I go more powerlifting-esque. <laughs> then I go more powerlifting-esque and, oh, cool, everything's packed. Elbows are tight. I'm like, I'm locked solid. Okay, cool. And now I'm like, I've actually gone back through that full circle and kind of gone back to understanding elbow flare and not necessarily having shoulder internal rotation and understanding why elbow flare might actually be better in some cases. So yeah. let's dive into why elbow flare might actually be quite good sometimes. Yeah, so this basically comes down to the way that the muscles attach around the shoulder and the easiest way to think about recruiting a muscle is that we want to take the origin away from the insertion. So if a muscle is a rubber band, we want to take each end away from each other. And pec major, the big chest muscle, is quite a cool muscle in that it extends, it lengthens in shoulder extension and shoulder flexion. So if you go, that's why dips and pullovers yeah. both work your chest, um, which is quite rare for a muscle to, to do that. With elbow flare, if you look at the uh, anatomy diagram of the pec, as the elbow goes wider is the main way that the pec muscle lengthens and loads. So that's why all pec stretches are putting your hand out to the side in some way, shape or form. So if we're looking to maximally recruit our pec, that's the direction we want to go. We want that elbow to go out to the side at about shoulder height, above or below will both uh, accentuate it more as well. But that's optimal for pec length. But why would we not want to do that? And there's a few factors that build into it. One is that a lot of people don't have the stability or control to stabilize and centrate the ball of their shoulder joint in its socket in that range of motion. So actually tucking the elbows down, keeping the lats in a more shortened position, they find it easier to keep that ball in the socket stable mm -hmm. as compared to having it um, further away. It's like if, if you're holding a dumbbell close to your shoulder, it's a lot easier to keep it under control compared to if it's at arm's length, the lever length is longer, so it's harder to stabilize. So especially using heavy weights, the shoulder is in a slightly more vulnerable position. So if you haven't, if you're working at a percentage which is challenging to control, you're more likely to get deviations away from optimal mechanics and wobbles that you, you get caught by surprise from as mm. compared to keeping the elbows tighter. So that would be the primary reason for, for my money as to why tucking the elbows mm. is better for more people. So yeah, this is now where I like to kind of put on my say performance hat here and actually say, with the bench press, and this is where I've done like a full 360, and then when I've actually understood movements a lot more through even just time under tension myself or with clients and stuff, understanding that the, the bench press is similar to the squat with knee valgus. So where knee valgus and knees want to come in and pop back out to kind of switch things on, when you're benching, having them quite tight on the way down, pushing up through that tight and then letting them flare enables that chest to get engaged and get more press out so if you're trying this is where then i used to be so like with that packed mentality of like everything needs to be tight consistently i found my bench got shit because i wasn't engaging as much chest because i was then trying to keep it all in my triceps whereas the cue of keeping your elbows packed like tight and the packed lats is 100 correct especially for heavy bench pressing because you want a stable shelf to press from it's understanding when to let the elbows come out. And this is then where if you're only staying in an outwards position, you're going to put your shoulders under unnecessary stress at high loads because it's just mm. they won't be able to get that range of motion, that full range of motion that you need from a power lifting bench press. So you need all the way to the chest and then back up. So by having those elbows a bit tighter, you create a better uh, spring effect. So when you're at that bottom, you're literally waiting for that recoil, that bounce to come back out. But by then allowing the elbows to come out, you enable the press and the shoulder, the chest and the triceps to really finish off the exercise. And I think 
this is where, like, as I said, the similarities of the knee valgus thing come in because it's it's not a problem if these things happen. It's it's the control. So yes. with the knees in, you don't want to necessarily just. Oh no, well, this is obviously you'll confirm this, but once the knees drop in, you don't want to necessarily just leave them there. Otherwise, then that's where all the force is going to. Whereas you want to be pushing them back out because it's what then switches your glutes back on and gets you back up. That's from what I've understood listening to you, and I hope I didn't just butcher that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but so, it's just, kind yeah. of. Kind of. So I think I really like your analogy of likening elbow flare to knee valgus mm. in that the body gives us clues as to where the strength is. So whenever somebody has a, like in air quotes, a sloppy rep, that's the body telling us that it needs mm. more strength and it's how it's getting it. So in knee valgus, the knees come in because it's getting the stretch reflex from the glutes in the transverse plane in deadlifting the back rounds because it's getting the spinal erectors to lengthen in sagittal so getting stretched through the back to then help get the bar up and in the bench press the elbows flare to get more recruitment from the pecs mm -hmm. so what's deemed as like bad form by a lot of people is actually just the body telling us where more strength is coming from and its uh, instincts are usually pretty mm. accurate like you say, it's only if they're uncontrolled that they become risky. Like any movement, if it's controlled, can be fine. So elbow flare isn't intrinsically wrong. It's just that it might not be a good idea for some people because they don't have control in that range. There's nothing wrong with elbows being level with your shoulders. If you think about how the body moves, if you're throwing a ball, if you're hitting a shot in any racket sport, your elbow is going to be level with your shoulder yeah. a lot of the time. So having strength and control in that position is a great idea. It's just if you're trying to bench super heavy and you haven't earned the right to be doing so in that elbow flared position, it might end up causing you some discomfort. There's no there's no like one right way to bench no. press for everybody. I just think, but I think the most important part about this, especially with the tucked elbows, is you're trying to get your lats engaged for the stability aspect and when your elbows are out, they're not; ju they're just not going to engage. So they, you're going to then be loading all, say, your upper back, shoulders, and say the chest in at the bottom position, rather mm -hmm. than having the elbows down slightly, say like 45 degrees ish. We're not talking about by the side of your chest. So we say about 45, 30 degrees ish. Getting that stretch so your lats can then become a support, so your triceps can essentially rest on your lats and then mm. press off of them. And this is this is where it's like. It's really important to say, a look at your technique or how things happen. And I think, you know, like when you said that the body leaves clues, but to not, if you're not being hurt from anything and you're, and you're progressing in weight, don't change it yet. Like the thing is, it's like, you might need to change that down the line, but why not get the maximum strength gains as possible in a, a kind of suboptimal lift? Like, you know, realistically for most people that say can't necessarily, they haven't had the time to have a coach or be taught the position or they, they can't really get it. And they're just trying and they're not getting any injury. For me, I'm like, then keep cracking on you. And and then when you start to say plateau in strength or maybe things, you start to maybe get a couple of niggles or something like that, then it's definitely time to maybe reassess. Some may say, okay, why not just start at the right place at the start? But if you haven't got a coach and you, you're not necessarily as willing to change, sometimes it's not the worst thing. But it's just, uh, it's just my opinion. So let's now move on to the lower body where we've discussed the arch already. But I think leg drive is something where I actually feel people probably hinder themselves more trying to leg drive than, than what they actually get the benefit from. So a lot of the time they're trying to think, right, I'm going to use leg drive to get this bar off. Now, if mm. I'm talking about in a competitive environment where when you're in a powerlifting competition, your bum cannot come off the bench. Okay. Now, what happens is, especially if you don't understand where to put your feet, if you put your feet too far below you and you're struggling, you're going to be essentially pushing your hips up. So you're pushing your bum off the bench. So you're having to then control your bum by keeping it down while pushing up. So you're not only trying to press a weight away from you, you're also trying to keep your bum on the bench. Mm -hmm. So just as a real uh, quick thing from here, where I like to recommend is kind of having your feet, if you imagine your shin angle, if you're going vertically down, you're at zero or say 90 degrees, keep it like that. You're going to be going more towards say like, 80 degrees, say 75, 80 degrees. So you're getting your feet a little bit away from you. So when you push into the floor, you actually push yourself backwards. 
Because if you're yeah. pushing yourself into the bench, you're going to elongate your neck and you're going to push the bar back towards the bench and up rather than actually push your hips up off the bench. Yeah, yes. And that's why a lot of um, powerlifters will chalk their upper back when mm-hmm. benching to, yep. to prevent themselves sliding up the bench because that, to refer back to what we are saying about the arch, one of the benefits of driving the feet into the ground is you're pushing your, sh- your body up the bench, which effectively pins your shoulders down mm. into your back. And it's the same theme of trying to create stability. We're trying to lock that body as still as possible because the more stable we are, the more weight we can lift if that is the goal of doing the bench press. But if we're, tr- if we're almost not so bothered about weight on the bar and we're looking for some core stability, for example, <laughs> yeah. like some people Grab do bench press it. for core stability, <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> then having feet even off the floor or mm-hmm. on the bench is going to make it harder to stabilize. So you're going to engage the trunk a little bit more mm. if that's the training stimulus that you seek. So those are the considerations for why you might use, uh, yeah, leg drive or not. And having foot blocks, a lot of people will put plates under their feet just so they can optimize the amount they can drive yeah. through the feet without the the bum coming off the bench. Happens a lot in like female powerlifting, as in like, you know, because mm. they, ha- they ne- haven't necessarily got as long legs, so they have to raise their feet up, which is why you might not realize, but if you're in a commercial gym and you have a bench, it has actually foot things that normally come out. A lot of them do. But mm. what you also find is with these commercial gyms is the bench itself is really slippery. So hence that chalk thing. So something that we used to do back in Virgin days is you get two rubber bands around the back, that round the bench. So when you slide, push yourself into the bench, you don't slide up the bench. Yeah. And so like these are the couple of cues that whenever I am benching, I'm always telling people, imagine long neck. Because by creating long neck, you're pushing yourself into the bench and getting your shoulders depressed. So you're mm-hmm. creating that optimal position so you're not coming all up into the traps and pressing through this, this weak position yeah. essentially. So... I guess this kind of all leads into now the execution. I know we've kind of dabbled into some of the execution points, but I think let's make it quite clear on the actual, the whole thing. So I think the very first thing is, I guess, the, as we've mentioned at the top, the grip position and then the actual unracking. So mm-hmm. this in itself is a skill because if you do not have a training partner or have anyone to unrack the barbell for you, you have to learn essentially how to protract and retract into position unless you've got a low barbell, which you can easily get out. You've got, say, adjustable rack that you can change your positions. But sometimes you have to be able to then, with load in your hand, be able to depress your shoulders. And this is if we're talking about a powerlifting bench. I'm, I'm going to be extremely biased in this whole episode and talk a lot more towards the powerlifting side of things. But I've obviously done it on the other side, so I, please obviously remind me if I'm going too far down the, the powerlifting <laughs> side. But when you are unracking that bar, getting it into the correct position, which for most is probably going to be slightly above the neck. So you want to think when the once you've got that bar in your hands, that bar has to come down towards your chest-ish area. So it's going to probably go anywhere between, say, you're like mid chest to maybe like your top abs somewhere around that range. Everyone's slightly different. But instead of thinking a straight line, you're going to think more like an arc. So that bar is going to say start from the neck potentially, end up down on the chest. So that's you getting your elbows tight, loading into the lats. And you're going to press the bar up and back in front of your face again or in line with the neck. Go on. Yeah. So I think this is a, the bar path in bench press is an interesting talking point because it's different to a lot of other barbell lifts Mm. in that it's not straight up and down. And the reason it can't be vertical, which is optimal from a physics point of view, because we don't want to be doing any extra work to raise the weight. The reason it has to be to stray away from vertical is that when you're locked out, the bar needs to be over your shoulders because that's where your arms attach to your body. Mm. And anything away from that uh, balance point is extra work to stabilize it. Same as what we're saying about the dumbbell and holding it at your shoulders easy, holding it at arm's length hard. To ha- to be locked out with a heavy weight above or below your shoulder, you're gonna be u- using a lot of energy just to keep it there. However, when we actually do the press, we bend the elbows to lower the bar straight down onto our shoulders would result in a really unfavorable elbow angle in that our elbows would no longer be under our hands so there'd be a huge amount of stress 
through the triceps and it's not a great uh, situation for stabilizing the shoulder you're basically doing like a horizontal skull crusher because <laughs> yeah. your hands are fixed on the bar yeah. and that's the distinction between barbell pressing versus dumbbell pressing is that the hands can go wider so you can actually go more vertical with dumbbell pressing as compared to barbell pressing so because the hands have to stay fixed to the bar and we want to keep our hands over our elbows i like to describe this to clients as think of your forearm as a rocket and you want to be firing that rocket from underneath the bar if the elbows get away from underneath the bar then the line of force actually isn't vertical anymore so we need to keep the forearms vertical and to keep the forearm vertical the elbows will have to go lower down the body so mm. the point of contact for the barbell will be around that sternum um, nipple height depending on where your nipples are <laughs> um, and uh, that means we can maintain uh, the good body mechanics if not the optimal physics mechanics and apply better force with happier shoulders into yeah. the bar yeah and i think that's i think that is key and i, th I think two things there shoulders is a better place than neck for me to say that's where i'm meaning because it's obviously where well, i'm looking at the bar yeah. it's over my neck but it's over my shoulders yeah. so that's so yeah please don't put it over say your chin so yeah that's 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 a good point and uh the second one i love that rocket analogy because i've so i'm always about vertical forearms and what i say is like same with the strict press the strict press is the one that does me in because people are trying to press with the elbows behind them i'm like wherever your forearm is facing is the direction that bar wants to go so, you know, if you're pointing, your elbows are pointing behind you, that bar is going to go away from you like an incline bench. You don't want to be doing that. So then you're going to change your body position to get that vertical yeah. forearm. Whereas why not just yeah. put your vertical forearm where it needs to go in the first place? So I love that rocket analogy. That's, yeah, that's a, probably a better way of saying it the way I normally say it. So, yeah, bar path. As I said, we, we're looking for that nice arc in motion to essentially create mm -hmm. that stretch reflex. Even if you're, say, performing it currently for like aesthetics in some degree, you're still going to want, it will feel quite natural to have, even if your elbows are flared, there's still going to be some tuck to, so it doesn't just blow out your shoulders. Because at the end of the day, if your elbows are all the way out to the side and you're coming down, you're going to feel your shoulders before you feel your chest, which is yeah. why people used to always complain about their shoulders hurting from bench press. And it's just like, it then got popularized to have a tuck and an arch. And then it kind of mm. went down the other, it went too far down that way. Then people then forgot about that. And when I say people, that includes me. That's a, I forget about where elbow flare actually comes in. So yeah. I guess pausing at the chest. Now, this is then part of the execution because it does depend on what you're performing it for. Now, if you're performing it for powerlifting purposes, you must pause until the judge says go. Right, so there's many ways you can do that. You've got then obviously bodybuilding where you're probably gonna want a light touch and go. So you're still maintaining that tension, but you're creating that full range of motion. So it's a little cue for you to say, okay, cool, I've got to that full range and I've come back up, but you don't wanna use your body to depress or lose any tension there. And I guess for powerlifting, as you said, you're, for CrossFit, you're trying to get as kind of just get it done in as easy as possible. So you're essentially gonna let that yeah. bar drop to the chest. So you're gonna essentially let that body drop underneath it so you can essentially screw yourself back out and explode out so yeah. pausing at the chest i think even for crossfitters i think is kind of a good way to train bench press to understand the skill and then you add in the explosiveness of a say like for crossfit and you're just trying to get down and up in a sweet as easy way as possible because same as like learning to kip in your pull-ups before you can do a strict pull-up is, is not necessarily you have to be able to do a strict pull-up to do kim pull-ups. I know a lot of people can do loads of kim pull-ups and barely do any strict pull-ups. But it just means you're going to have a much more stable base and a better understanding of your body by the time you then get to the more dynamic movement, which for me is just key thing. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great point in that in powerlifting and competing in CrossFit, you're trying to achieve the movement standard and make it as easy as possible. However, in training, when we're looking to develop the body, we're not just thinking about movement standards, we're thinking about what's gonna make us better most effectively. Mm. So even though in a competitive CrossFit workout, you need to touch your chest and fully lock out, that doesn't mean that's the only way we need to execute the bench press in training. And especially if somebody's bouncing the bar off their chest and losing control at that point, that's a really good argument for including pauses at the chest for training so that 
when they are competing, there's a much better level of control in that range of motion. Um, for me, there's also the fundamental question of, do we need to touch the chest in the first place? Mm, and in sure. those sports, we absolutely do, because that's the rules of the game. However, from a, like a bodybuilding point of view or a general health point of view, the range of motion is pretty much arbitrary, depending yeah. on the shape of your rib cage, depending on your lever length, it'll be easier or harder to actually make that contact. And by forcing the depth, you could be forcing somebody into poor shoulder positions. Like it's related to the bar path question as well as if you're trying to keep the bar over your shoulders all the way to uh, contact, to get that depth and to get the mm. bar close to your body with the hands high, you're actually going to have to internally rotate your shoulders mm. and internal rotation of the shoulders will deload the pecs and it will deload the lats. So you're creating a much less stable shoulder. So most people want those muscles to be stimulated in the bench press, but by deloading them, we're losing the training stimulus. So you could say a similar thing about depth. If you're forcing chest contact in the bench press, you might actually lose engagement of your target muscles. So you're um, increasing risk and also decreasing the uh, beneficial stimulus from the exercise for a hypertrophy reason, for example. Yeah, and this is where I'm like, I this is where I go down a school of thought where if I'm trying to grow my chest, I'm not necessarily going to be, bench press isn't going to be my prime chest exercise for growing my chest. And I'd much prefer to utilize things like dumbbells because you're going to get a fuller range of motion anyway. And it doesn't, you've got, you haven't got this stiff bar in the way. And I'm like, don't get me wrong. I love the fact that people say want a bench press to grow their chest. And, but because it's a nice way to overload, it's simple, right? It's really good progressive overload. You're not going to worry about the stability factor of a dumbbell, which I said to you at the start when it kind of, once you get to a certain weight of the dumbbell, it starts becoming too much of a stability game that is an actual chess game. And you're like, mm -hmm. oh. so then you go to the, the bench press, the chest press machine, and then you're like, okay, it makes a bit more sense. But when it comes to, um, say, progressions through this, something that I like to think about when I'm when I'm personally training it and going through, like whether you do the pause or anything like that, is I tend to go through ways of like starting out with like some tempo bench. So again, understanding, because we're, we're gonna lead into some tempo stuff in a second, but understanding that what my movement is supposed to be. And then from there, I'm gonna go into some pause reps. So I might do say sets of three for pause reps where I'm pausing on my chest for say two seconds. And then in the next block, I might then go for some first rep pause and then light touch and go after that because then that makes it a bit more competition, competition specific because you only got to pause once on your chest. So then I'm just getting overloaded of muscle with that heavier weight for the light touches for the subsequent reps. And then I'll be probably into my singles block where I will be pausing on the chest and pressing through. So I'm kind of getting that closer to that specificity, the closer I get to say my end peaking block. But the pause at the chest part is only really for powerlifters. Mm. So it's just like, I for me, I think it's a, it's a nice way to show control, even if you're not a powerlifter. So it just means that you've earned the right to be there and you was able to stop the weight and then you was able to re-engage the weight. And for me, control is one of the key things, especially in bench press where people can complain a lot of time about their shoulders. Yep, yep. And I think it's very related to the pause at the chest is the other counterpoint to that is the lockout. Mm. Similarly, it's, it's almost the same in that a strong, clean lockout is part of the movement standard in the sport of powerlifting and CrossFit. So you've got to demonstrate that you've done it. However, if that's not something that's important to you, you could increase the time under tension by not locking out. So if you never rest the bar at the top or the bottom, then the time under tension of the working set will go up because you're not giving mm. the muscles that reprieve. So there's a great business case for actually never locking out until you finish the set if you're trying to grow your chest through the bench press. Yeah, and I, I think just to add on to that bit as well, I think where that can kind of sometimes get misunderstood is you see like pro bodybuilders and like the, uh, uh, do these little short like little pump reps and you're like, so then people like use that on say the bench press and I'm just like, you can still show control by not locking out. And that's literally, you're getting right to the top of the movement and you pause with your arms still flexed and then bring it back down like, 
like shorten time under tension reps doesn't mean faster. And this is, mm. it's like, it's like time, it's in the name, time under tension, right? So you're trying to keep the tension through the chest. So don't make your set go quicker by doing eight short reps, <laughs> just more time under tension and don't take the tension yeah. away from the chest. Keep it more in the chest and don't lock it out into the triceps and hold it through your joints. Because that's what a lot of, say, CrossFit and powerlifting is. It's just locking out positions and holding through the joints. So it's your finished position. So you're not holding it in your muscle. It's very energy, exactly. Yeah, I think a great workaround for that, something that I use with clients in the past, is um, rather than saying it's eight reps, say it's 40 seconds of yeah. tension and set a clock so that like they can go faster, but it just means they do more reps and... It's one way to keep people honest. If if you set them tempo reps, say it's three one mm. x one, it should take five seconds per rep. Yeah. So you can work out whether they're actually sticking to it or not by the total set time, um, and there's no hiding from the clock. Yeah, but I, I think again, tempo reps are great, but you do need to then weigh up why you're using tempo reps. I know this is a slight detour uh, tangent here, but like. For me, tempo reps are great for understanding control of a movement, but a lot of the time they're so submaximal that if you are training for that top end and you want that uh, top end exp exposure, we need to make sure you're still keeping that specificity of heavy load, because it's I so like I use so the example of uh, my my training, I used tempo bench with a four second. Um, eccentric so that lowering phase a two second pause in the chest and explode explosive press out right so i use that for my first four weeks of building up strength because i've just come out of a powerlifting meet so my body was quite it was a high stress you know been i've peaked into that so it was a way for me to still keep specific to the movement but deload the load so i was able to control stuff and i was then able to do four weeks of essentially a deload but, st but get better at the movement because I was understanding getting into that position and getting myself out of that position under control. And for me, control understanding how to get from A to B is one of the most important bits, right, of, of powerlifting. You need to get through A, B, and back in a nice, smooth way. And I found time, like tempo bench is a really nice way to kind of eliminate any issues on that. So, so common mistakes, I think, <clears throat> is... a I think we've been talking a lot today about the competition style and we've mentioned about you know if you're benching for life is it just to grow your chest because you want you want to grow your chest or are you doing it because it's super functional like what why are you benching so i guess understanding why you're benching is number one yeah exactly i think um because it has that ego lift reputation for a lot of people, they almost forget why they're training in the first place. And when the bench comes out, it's just how much can I lift? I kind of lift more than the guy I'm working with today. <laughs> and you lose focus for actually how you're trying to adapt your body. So say it is um, hypertrophy is your current goal. You're looking to build some muscle. But as soon as the bench comes out, you lose your form, you lose your tempo. And it's literally you're arching your back. You're driving your feet into the ground. You're doing everything you can just to get the heaviest rep you can possible you're cutting your sets short you're working to like the bottom end of your rep ranges mm. all these things are basically come down to how much is on the bar whereas your focus overall should be on yeah say more hypertrophic training and you lose focus i think bench press has a special ability to <laughs> make people do that compared yeah. to any other yes. movement um, yeah. because because of that ego lift uh, reputation yeah. So that'd be number one is just being very clear on exactly why you're doing it. Equally, it could go the other way. It very rarely does. Like if you are training for powerlifting, keeping your focus on that lower rep range and working fast without getting much of a pump, that's what you should be focused on. So just being very aware of the why behind why bench press is in your program in the first place. Yeah. The top one. Yeah, and I think I think what kind of leads on from that, another common mistake is because bench press has been done by so many bros and brorettes over the years that they feel they're quite experienced at bench press. And then obviously by them being so, they think they're experienced, they're not understanding and how to level up their bench press and how to actually get stronger at the bench. Now, what I mean by that is if you're quite a beginner lifter, 
you can probably do a lot of just upper body strength and hypertrophy work to get better at benching and not have to specify too much into the nuance of, of the bench press because having a stronger back means you're going to have a lot more control of your scapula. You're going to have a lot more of a stable base for the bench to essentially rest on. Um, you need to build up tissue tolerance and joint function. Like, you know, you need to be able to hold that load. I think one of the things we mentioned about in the execution is just that thing of being able to just hold that bar above you and feel and feel solid. And especially when you are getting quite heavy, that becomes a skill in itself. Um, then understand, then if you have been if you go more towards the intermediate per place, I think then focusing maybe on a bit more push focus stuff. So then you are going to start to think, like, cool, I need to do more chest, triceps, shoulders. So then you can start to maybe go a little more down that route of strength and um, hypertrophy. And then if you go down into the advanced, then you start looking at weak points. And so understanding where you are in your bench press journey can really give you a good idea of what you should be doing to increase your bench if that is your goal. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's a really good point. And the, the principle behind it is essentially that if like how specialized do you want to get into bench pressing? Mm. Because if powerlifting is your sport, there's so many different variations around specific components of the bench press that you could be working on. You could be working on lockout, could be working on the bottom portion of the lift, you could be working on stability and bracing, all sorts of nuances of honing a bench press. But actually, if you're just looking for upper body strength, then should it even be in the program is the first question. Like for mm. what you want your upper body to do, is mm. bench press even the right movement? And maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but you want it in anyway. If you want it in anyway, then what role should it play in your training program? Like Rob was saying there, if you're uh, relatively new to strength training, or even if you're not, if you want a robust upper body, which has a lot of functionality in multiple different pursuits, then having a massive focus on bench press probably isn't optimal because you're training such a specific movement in a specific situation. Like we're saying about the shoulder position, you're training your shoulder to be depressed and, and retracted, but you want your shoulder to be able to operate in 360 degrees mm. of motion. And by being overly specific, you're actually training out optionality because you're developing such extreme strength in such a specific situation that it's probably not giving you the general physical preparedness that you're looking for in your program. So the fundamental question is, should you be benching in the first place? Should you be barbell benching? I guess that's the big thing because, you know, obviously benching with dumbbells on a flat bench, like you'd get more bang for your buck if you're trying to be functional because then you're getting a yeah. full range of stability demand on your shoulders. So there, there's so much more from it. So obviously the it's horizontal pressing is part of getting stronger all round round as all round round being gpp like you want to be prepared for everything so you never know that that wardrobe might fall on top of your chest one day and you need to press it off who knows but i you know i think it's what i love there is you mentioned onto one of the points of that depressed shoulder position and this is why i'm saying my training and stuff that i go through all my group training as well where shoulder i make sure when I train the bench press, I train it specifically for powerlifting. So I, I, or for strength gain, like it is purely about being in that position, depressed shoulders, long neck, chest tall, getting as much a weight moving as possible, using it quite specific to that. But then when it comes to my accessories, if it's not necessarily being bench press accessory one, say where I might be say doing some close grip or some feet up bench or something like that, I might be doing some like landmine presses with a barbell and pressing my shoulder through full range of motion. So I'm now taking or doing some parallel push-ups where I'm letting my shoulders go into internal rotation and then putting myself back out. So I'm taking my shoulders through ranges of motion, not always being in a um, retracted state and getting them into some protraction as well to get them forward because we want your shoulders to be prepared for everything. Like that's that when you especially when you're going down the functional route and want you don't want to be always training yourself in this retracted state and depressed shoulders. It's just you, <laughs> you know when I think it's, if you picture someone and say you know you got oh that gym bro with the lats, chest up, shoulders down like that's not a normal position to be in. You don't want to be walking around like yeah. that. So you know yeah. it's it's quite an important thing to then make sure you are training outside of that as well. 
yeah i think it's almost worthy of it's a podcast on its own it's just mm. shoulder mechanics that there's this notion that's pervasive in fitness that a depressed and retracted shoulder is where it should be and almost agnostic of the movement that it's relative to like, yeah it should be there for deadlifting it should be there for squatting it should be there for overhead pressing which i find mental that you're trying to push something up but you're trying to pull your shoulders down yeah. at the same time <laughs> and like if you look at the structure of the shoulder joint it's clearly meant for movement and the fact that the scapula slides over the rib cage in so many yeah. directions by training it to only be still in one situation we are fighting our biology we're blocking what it wants to do and what it was designed for so fair enough if you're trying to maximize your bench then there is an optimal shoulder mechanics for that specific movement but for life even for like walking and running mm. the shoulders moving the scapula's moving about the rib cage and we need to bear that in mind when we're designing training programs that we do give a more broad spectrum of stimuli to the shoulder so it does, we're not training out the optionality we're yeah. training it in to increase our movement options rather than decrease them yeah i think that's, that's so important and something that i i think is when it comes to the, 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 the uh, when it comes to the depressed shoulder mm. I think it's a good place to start for most people when they're getting into training because it helps them understand stability as, a, as an external thing. So if they're thinking shoulder, this is just from my personal experience. I'm just thinking, so like if I'm thinking about shoulders down, it's really easy to keep them still, right? And if I'm trying to say press something vertically, it's not necessarily an optimal position because as soon as I get overhead, I'm actually doing an incline bench. So I have to let my shoulder go into that protracted state to actually get it to my overhead position. But a lot of the time, what I like the depressed shoulder thing, um, the depressed shoulder cue for is because it gets people to kind of feel the shelf that they can create with their lats and their chest because it creates a shelf right across their upper chest area where they can feel the bar sitting rather than, say, being in a project state where their chest is switched off. So it, it, it's, it's one of those things where I know you're not the biggest fan of, uh, well, I'm pretty sure you're not a big fan of, kind of like doing something which is kind of counterintuitive to get change it down the line, whereas why not just sort it out in the first place and do it right from the start? But I think for quick fixes, it helps people understand because it's an easy thing to fill. So when you've got less time, I'm just thinking a lot of time in a class environment. And I was trying to think, I remember like getting people to understand how to use their chest in a strict press. I found having them being in a depressed state and then going into a protracted state actually was a bit easier for them to understand and kind of understand and kind of holding it in with a protracted shoulder across their chest. I know we're talking about strip press now, but it's like thinking about this and pressing from here, I found people found it a little bit easier to get from the lats to the, into that position. This, again, that's probably not necessarily right, but it's just a cue which I found has helped quite a few people. Yes, yeah, so just to clarify, I'm not saying that you should keep the shoulder protracted yeah. throughout either. So, yeah. the, the, like, if the the rule of thumb for me for how you want to organize your shoulder is wherever the direction of travel is, the shoulder wants to mm. go with it. So, right. if the bar is down, then the shoulder blades can be down. But when the bar is going up, the mm. shoulder blades are going to go up. Yeah. If the bar is going back, like into the bench then the shoulder blades will be back. If the bar is going away from the chest, then we can go forwards into protraction. It's like the same with push-ups in that people cut their push-ups short because they don't want to go into protraction. Yeah. And then people program scap push-ups as a separate exercise. So why don't you just finish it? Like full range of motion push-up. Exactly, yeah. Push the floor as far away from you as you can. And you're then getting a scap push-up built into a regular push-up. It's yeah. just strange that we have these... Um, ideas that protraction is bad if you do it with something else yeah, exactly but a scat push-up on its own is a great exercise it's, uh, well it's control isn't it and i think that's that's i think people are scared of is this is when i said a, a little bit ago when i mentioned about tempo is like 
Tempo means you can keep up with yourself. I say, I say to a lot of my clients, and this is why I don't like, say, with the squat, when people just dive bomb to the bottom because you haven't been able to keep up with yourself. So essentially, if you imagine your brain firing all these things, saying, right, you've got to do this, 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 and you're already at the bottom of the squat, it's like, fuck, I've got to get out of it. Same as with the bench press. If you're literally dropping that bar to your chest, it's like, shit, what am I supposed to use to press this back up? So I'm not saying a slow, slow tempo. But you look at some of the biggest lifts, biggest bench presses ever, nearly all come down with a form of tempo because they're loading to explode. Just like every, it's just it's just the way it is. And it's just like, if you drop, it's, it's just dropping and hoping. And you don't want to bring hope into strength training because <laughs> that, that's that, that just, just ne- never a good time. But something else I want to kind of kind of just bring up is a common mistake with bench press is progressions from it and I think people kind of get a little bit disheartened and they're like oh I've only put say like five kilos on the bench or like and they're comparing it to their squat their deadlift and you have to look at the bench press and the strict press is the worst because I think we've all been there with the strict press when it's not going up and it's like oh I only put on two kilos or something like that fuck but when you actually put it into perspective of like percentages so if you've got a 200 kilo deadlift, 10% of that's 20 kilos. But if you go to a bench press of 100 kilos, 10% is 10 kilos. So having the 10% increase. But then what about when you go to a strict press of say 50 kilos? A five kilo increase is 10%. Like that's mm. huge. And like, yeah. I think because we see it as oh, it's only five kilos, it's like we disregard five kilos as being a lot. But think about what you're pressing with and how much of the body you're using for that lift. So progressions, I think take the wins for what they are and like you know small progressions are great progressions you're still moving forward and then if you obviously stagnate then address it but i think that's a quite an issue when people don't people expect too much on their bench press because they're comparing it to say their deadlift or their squat yeah yeah i think that's really important to bear in mind that you're not going to make as quick a progress in terms of raw kilos yeah Hmm. great okay so Let's get a little bit more um, into the tweaks. Mm. So if we are looking to stimulate our chest, for example, you've said it a few times already, barbell bench press might not be the best way to develop your chest. And that's something I definitely agree with. I think looking at the principles of what we're trying to achieve in developing an area or muscle group is we need to get length through the muscle to then get shortening through the muscle. So we're getting a nice strong contraction, um, but ensuring that the muscle is loading through a good range. And if we're looking at the chest in particular, like Rob said earlier, if the bar's there, that limits the amount of um, horizontal abduction. So basically the elbow behind the chest Mm. that we're able to get. And if we look at other classic chest exercises like cable flies or even dumbbell bench or yeah, dumbbell flies or the pec deck machine they're always trying to achieve that elbow behind the torso to get maximum stretch through the chest and then bringing the hands together or even crossed over in cable flies to get maximum shortening in that horizontal adduction or hands across the midline into those pec flies so one tweak if you still want to bench and you want to combine it with that press movement is to do dumbbell bench but almost make it a hybrid with a dumbbell fly in that Mm. the hands go wider so you get more stretch through the chest you will be able to lift a lot less in this movement because the leverage is less favorable but you will get more length through the chest and my top tweak for that as well to get even more stretch through the chest is when you're at the bottom of the movement if you externally rotate the shoulders you're getting more twist and stretch through the pecs in the transverse plane and then as you lock out in front of you if you do lock out turn your hands in to maximally shorten the muscle at the top as well and you'll feel that there's more pec activation if you if you add those tweaks in yeah i i love that i remember so doing the rota- that type of rotation because that's for me when it comes to dumbbell flies i actually prefer to do my dumbbell flies a bit more like that where i come down and let my arms bend like that rather than kind of keeping the weight far away from me because i find with a dumbbell it just feels counterintuitive because where the weight is and it ends up loading my shoulder more nearly all the time and however when i then translate that over to say cables and bands where we have that that constant resistance at the full range of motion 
I keep, I imagine my arms in a cast, like a slightly bent cast, and it stays mm-hmm. in that position going down to the bro days. I love it. But like that, that constant stretch and contraction. And for me, I think if you are doing flies, I'm, I'm, I'm so much more down the road on used cables or bands, just, just because of that reason where you're holding the weight. I just think it's just, you get better, ex- better, better contraction. And like, it's so important what Ash said there is in like, you might be using less weight, but if your goal is to stimulate the muscle, the weight doesn't matter. The weight is the tool we're using to stimulate it. So it doesn't matter if it's 10 kilos, 20 kilos, the body doesn't know. It just knows it's load being stressed on the body. So be very aware of that because I think we get so caught up in load, especially when it comes to things like the bench press, because it is such an egotistical lift, is we, we forget that if, if you're doing it for growth and you're thinking about putting as much on that bar, you, you, you're at two, you're at opposite ends. Like you're not getting the potential stimulus that you could out of it. So I think another tweak is also changing the bar you use. Now this is a very specialty style exercise where you're not really going to get many gyms, especially commercial gyms, Manny, but you're not going to get many gyms with like the bar, like you've got the Swiss bar, You've got the cambered bar where you get the extra, sh- mm. like that bar is, a, oh, I've used that once, it's such a beautiful, like you talk, like the type of stretch you get with the dumbbell, but you can get that same stretch with the barbell because it, the bar essentially is already bent. So it means you get that extra range of motion. It feels amazing, but it's changing your grip. Well, then again, it's going to put your shoulder into a different position and same as like doing pull-ups, talking about pull-ups, where you put your, how you hold the bar, whether you're prone supine like neutral wherever you're holding is going to be in a state that loads you into a better position for whatever you're going to be and a neutral grip that's why i really like neutral grip um dumbbell chest press because for me i use it as like a tricep kind of dominant exercise and just because i can just rep out same as like i like using a um a weight plate for floor press because the same, mm. it does reduce the range of motion, but being on the floor press, it's a tricep dominant exercise because it's not going to get down to my chest anyway. But yeah, I, that nice neutral grip, so changing grips can be a, if you've got the ability to, can be a really good way to kind of challenge yourself in a different way. Yeah, exactly. And it, going back to what we were saying about elbow flare, having a neutral grip is going to take you away from that that elbow flare another level. So it will be a bit more tricep and maybe shouldery. But for people who've had shoulder injuries and struggle to control and stabilize a shoulder in abduction, that might be a great idea and lets you get your bench press fix um, without doing a huge amount of work on improving your mechanics, which you should do. But yeah, <laughs> you definitely, definitely should. But I think, I think just, just to kind of summarize all of this, I think it's so important to understand why you're bench pressing and whether that's barbell bench pressing, dumbbell bench pressing, whether it is just because you want to look good or you want to do it because you're competing, then that's cool. But make sure you understand why you're doing it. And then if you need to do any accessories for that, understand why you're doing accessories. Are you doing it because you're a powerlifter? Then there's probably going to be certain accessories you want to do. Are you doing it for chest activation? Then there are going to be different accessories that you want to do. So as we discussed it, like with the tweaks. So understanding that the barbell is just one way to bench press. It's just we're lying on a bench horizontally. So I think another thing as well, is making sure that you're not fixated on always thinking about having your scapula depressed in all pushing exercises. And this is something, as I said, that I've developed myself over the years and when you understand that it's not always about being this stiff person trying to move because it's just not a practical thing. It's like, I know you mentioned about that me before the guy always like in the plank position <laughs> or <laughs> doing all the, all like the, like doing all these um, normal functional things or picking things up like that. It's just, it's just not good for you because you want to be thinking outside of the box, especially when you're trying to be like ready for life. If you're doing yeah. powerlifting, then do the depressed shoulder. That's what you need to be good at. But when you go inside outside that, you're deviating a bit. You're not necessarily competing. Have the depressed with the power with the powerlifting and bench press, and then when you're going outside of that, get your shoulders to get their full range of motion, and you know experiment with ranges. And I think one of the main things we said at the start was make sure there's control. 
because that's where shit goes wrong when you don't have control. Things like a Jefferson's curl. People get scared of doing a Jefferson's curl because they're just like, that's just going to do my back in. So that's like a really, if you imagine a worst deadlift possible, if you don't know what Jefferson's curl is, essentially all your spine curls up and your essentially head goes down towards your feet with a completely rounded back. But when you actually think about it, you're decompressing all your vertebrae. And it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful mood. It feels great. But so many people get scared of things like that because they think, oh, I'm putting myself into compromised position. But if you do it under control, you'd be fine. Yeah. Yeah, spot on. And I think just the last thing I wanted to say um, that I forgot earlier was around that shoulder point. Of, we don't just want shoulder movement variation. One of the principles of shoulder mechanics is that the shoulders are obviously linked to the T-spine. Mm. So it's very rare in natural movement, if you can call it that, that the shoulders move independent of the spine. So this is one of the hang-ups I have with bench press is that we're training spine the spine to be still and all the movement to come from the shoulders whereas actually in sport in life we're never using the shoulders without the spine so if we can get the spine moving in harmony with the shoulders rather than independently from the shoulders that actually unlocks a lot of um, power and strength so even if bench pressing is your goal having some accessory movements where you're getting the spine and the shoulders to work together will improve the recruitment you get from all the muscles of the shoulder and i think especially if you're not a competitive power lifter that's a great idea mm. full stop it's only the specificity of competing in the bench press which really necessitates the still spine and moving shoulders it's where, where I'm such a big fan of the landmine shoulder press. Like for me, it's such a, it feels like such a safe exercise because you're the barbell, say, jammed into the corner or in a landmine attachment. And you're able to press through a controlled range of motion and take your shoulder through a full range and have some rotation. You can do so much with that bit of kit for like shoulder health and just general shoulder strength. I think it's an awesome yeah awesome accessory to throw into your training if you've never done it before i'll put a link down below where you can see a demo of that exercise because it's it is somewhat it's just you must do this this exercise it's just great so uh yeah i like that exercise so i think that's been amazing i've absolutely loved today you know i love talking about anything all powerlifting-esque it's great strength stuff so i hope you've enjoyed it as much as i have and i'm sure ash has enjoyed this too Please share, as always, with anyone you think might enjoy it. You know, don't forget to tag us on Instagram, lunge at lunge.lift. You know, we're obviously trying to grow our YouTube still. So if you head over to YouTube, there's a link in our bio to all our, all our areas. You can find us, subscribe, you know, like, share, all that good stuff. Reviews on Apple Podcasts will be amazing. Uh, Spotify, that cheeky five stars. And, you know, it's going to help us get even more content because we're going to start to understand what you guys want because you're hearing the reviews of what you like and what you don't like hopefully then obviously improve get even more quality guests on you know maybe you want a guest to come back on because we've got a couple lined up to come back like we've had Liam on multiple times so we'd love to hear if you want someone back on and you know if you want to if you are looking to get strong and you're feeling inspired this year after all this bench press talk check out my uh, stronger group coaching where we can focus on getting you stronger and bigger this year so thanks a lot for your time as always we'll see you next week thanks guys